Okay, the question that was raised to class um, was how do we determine, how do we write a SQL statement that will show the number of votes and not each individual vote that, uh, that uh, a possible answer has. And we're actually, we're moving in the right direction with what is on the board, select count distinct. Um, let's, let's talk about it and let's talk about where we went in the wrong direction a little bit here but we're also somewhat in the right direction. So I'm going to pull down what we had last time, and I'm going to add the necessary tables first, just to refresh you, uh, uh, refresh all our memories of the, of the data structure. And then I'm going to go in and we'll talk about how we would do it. And, and we'll talk about sort of the method that I would take in determining how to do this. Which again, you know, it's a technique I use. Your mileage may vary. I'll tell you, two out of the three words on the board are correct. Which two do you think are correct? Well, you should know what you should know one of them that's correct, right? Select. Select. All right. So which one do we need and which one do we not need? We need count. We don't need distinct. What distinct would do would be if we wanted, if we only wanted to see the options that got votes regardless of how many votes they got, we could do that with a distinct. So what a distinct does is it returns, it's like a regular select, except it returns only unique combinations of things. So for example, let's say I have a student table that has a city and state, all right? And let's say I'm not interested in how many students are from each city. I just want to know what cities there are that have students here at LC. So I don't care like that there's 5,000 from Vermilion and, and 7,000 from Illyria and, and whatever. Let's say I don't care about the numbers. I just want to see the list of cities. Then I would say select distinct city state from student. And that would give me a list of the cities and states for which there are at least one student. So. That's sort of on the right track, but not quite there. Count is the one, and count is what's called an aggregate function. But anyhow, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's go and build these tables and do this. And I debated whether to um, do this example or not, but I think it's a good idea because I think, you know, this is something that you might have had in CISS 143 depending on who taught it and, and, and so on. Um, and even if you did have it or if you didn't have it, it doesn't hurt to review or go over it for the first time. Uh, the one thing about SQL that, that is really kind of cool is that there's a relatively few number of commands, but with those commands you can retrieve data in all different kinds of ways. All right. So, so far we've been looking at Join, at, at pulling data, um, simply seeing every individual row. This one's a little bit different because we want to combine rows together. So let me pull down the example. We'll add the tables and we'll play around writing the SQL statement to do this.
right, so right now we have a answers table and a poll table. We need two more tables to get this done, right? We need a user table and we need a vote table. So I want to go through the steps of creating all of these tables and then we will um, go in and, and, and do the SQL. All right, the first table I'm going to create is the user table. So I'll go here and say create table. I will go into design view and I'll call it user. I'm going to make the primary key of this user ID. And I'm going to put in an email address. All right? And the email address is what they're going to use to log on. Right? Because that's easier to remember than a user ID. The user ID, remember, is going to be automatically generated by the system. All right, so it's just going to be one, two, three, four, and so on going up. The email address, of course, is going to be the person's actual email. Now, what can you say about email address? What constraint would we like to put on the email address? Must be entered, so it's required. All right. Should two people be able to have the same email address? No. no. Hmm. If you take those two constraints and combine them, email address sounds almost like what? It's required and it has to be unique. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like user ID, but it sounds like a primary key in more general terms. So email address is also something that could be the primary key. What do we call it? And in an election year, this, this should be an easy question to answer. What do we call it when we have two fields that each could be the primary key? Each of them by themselves be primary key. This isn't a composite key where them together are a primary key. This is where either the user ID or the email address could be the primary key. What do we call those? Candidate keys, right. How do you decide what the candidate key, which key to use then? Should I make both of them the primary key together? The answer to that is no, all right. A primary key ought to be minimal, all right. What do I mean by minimal? In other words, user ID by itself is unique. Email address by itself is unique. So there's really no reason to combine them together. You're not making it uniquer, all right? There's only, you know, it's either unique or it's not. And therefore, you shouldn't combine two unique fields together. That violates the minimal property. That is, if one of the fields is unique, there's no need to combine it with anything else. Why do you think I decided to choose user ID? I could have just as well made the primary key email address. But why do you think I chose user ID? Because it's something that we assign. Something that we assign? What's the implication of that? We control it. We control it? These are all good thoughts, but I'm not really sure that that's any different than the email address. If you used it in, the, like, as a, in another table as a foreign key, yes. relate to this table? Yes. A number is much easier to put in than a long email address. Ah, exactly. That's, that's getting more to it. It's less a case of being easier to put in, because we can design the user interface. 
and more of a case of it takes up less storage. All right, numbers can be stored more efficiently than characters can. So, if I and I, again, how do you relate two tables together? You relate them together by having the primary key of one table serve as a foreign key in another table. So if I am stuffing in a number or if I'm stuffing in an email address, the number can be stored more efficiently and therefore the foreign keys can be stored more efficiently. The other small consideration is that um, an email address could potentially change, whereas uh, a user ID is always going to be constant. And changing primary keys, while it's possible to do it, you generally sort of avoid doing that. All right, simply because it can be used as foreign keys and so on and so forth. All right, so that's why I would pick user ID. The main reason I would is because numbers can be stored more efficiently than characters could. And therefore, anything that's related to this table, um, I'm going to be stuffing in a user ID and not a long email address. All right, now, is there anything special I should do with email address, though? Because I still don't want it to be unique, right? If people are logging on via it, yes? The formatting property so that they have to have it in a certain format. Okay. Uh, we could do that, and we could validate that. Um, we could, first of all, make it a required field. There's one other thing that we could do, though. Keep in mind that, I'm not sure that would work outside of access if we form, if the formatting. We can actually index this. And what's more, we can make a unique index. All right. What does a unique index mean? It means it's going to be indexed. What does it mean to say it's going to be indexed? It means that you can look up, easily look up rows in the table using this field. All right. But with no duplicates, it means it's going to be guaranteed to be unique. So I cannot have two people with the same email address. As a general rule, that's what you do with candidate keys. If something is truly a candidate key, that is, that every row has one and has to have it, and is going to be unique, you would go in and say that it's required. You would go and say in that you're going to create a unique index on it. No duplicates allowed. Question. Would this keep people from um, keep doing the thing over and over? This would keep someone from registering with the same email address. All right. So um, if I tried to register uh, again and I use the same email address, um, it would give me an error when I tried to tried to register. What does indexing mean? Indexing is, provides an alternative way to look something up. Think of it like ways of uh, looking up a book in a library, right? Most libraries, in, back, in fact, in back in the old days, you would actually have card catalogs where you looked up books by cards, and there was a card catalog for title. There was one by subject. There was one by author, all right? Now you might not have that, but you have a search where you can enter in an author, a title, or a subject, and do a search for books. Not everything is indexed, right? You don't index a book, for example, on the color of the cover, all right? Well, this book has a green cover. Let me find all the books that have green covers, right? Why? Because that doesn't seem terribly useful. Not too many people are going to say, well, what kind of book do you want to read? I want to read a green one. Well, that's not very common. So it's very rare that you'd want to look up a book like that. So color of cover, if it was an attribute in the database, would not likely to be indexed. But you will put index on alternate ways of getting at a field. In other words, you know, if I call my bank, Right, and I uh, they will ask me for my account number. Right? Why do they ask me for my account number? Well, because that's probably like primary key to certain tables. Right? 
What if I don't have my account number? What are they going to ask me? They're going to ask me for other identifying information that will allow them to look me up quickly. They might ask me for my phone number or my email address or social security number or something along those lines. And there are probably indexes on those fields, which means that they could do a quick lookup on it. All right? So you put indexes on things that you want to make unique and that you want to provide a quick lookup for. All right? You can look something up in a database on any field. It's just a matter of how quick and how efficient the lookup is going to be. Why not put an index on every single field then? Well, it takes up more resources. All right? You have to update indexes every time you do an insert or an update or delete. There's storage space required and so on. So if there's a field that you're not particularly going to use to look someone up, there's no need to make it an index. But if you're going to look someone up by it, you know, I could see, for example, having a contact us on this website that says, if you have a problem, give us your customer number or your user number or your email address. And in that way, we could look them up by either of these two ways. All right. So... I'm not going to put a lot of fields in, but I do want to put user ID, email address, full name, and user password. believe I did. And that's a good catch. We would want to do that. Probably also want to put the name as being required as well. Now, our vote table, remember, is going to connect Our, name, our vote table is going to con connect the user and the answer together. So it's really going to contain just the keys in those tables. So I'm going to create a table. And I'm going to call it my vote table. And I'm going to make the user ID and the poll ID the primary key. How do I make two fields a primary key? I just drag the little thing like that and click the primary key. And lastly, I'm going to make the sequence number which corresponds to the answer. I'm going to make that in the table as well. All right, so we have some foreign keys to create. <laughs> That, by the way, the way that I constructed that key is what's going to keep a user from being able to vote twice because I made the primary key question and user ID or poll ID and, and user ID. Therefore, the combination of user and poll can only be in that table once. All right, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to show these other two tables. And we're going to create foreign keys between vote and user. Enforce referential integrity, yes. I'm actually making a two-part foreign key. 
In other words, the primary key of the answers table is poll ID and sequence number. And so I need to connect the poll ID and sequence number of the vote to the poll ID and sequence number of the answers. Let's see if Access will let me do that. It's supposed to let me do that, but I seem to recall having issues with this in the past. So we'll, we'll see. And it is not letting me do that. So this will be one of those rare cases where I will not create the foreign key. All right. It's another reason for using the single part keys. If I create it, actually I can fix that. I think. We'll leave, it, we'll leave it out. This is one of the rare cases that we're not going to have a foreign key for that. So we're going to have to be extra careful for that to work. All righty. So let's go in and let's put uh, a couple users in. three users. So let's say me and Paul like Kickstart and Don likes Monster. So I'll go in the vote table and user ID of one for poll one like answer three. User ID two for answer, or for poll one, likes answer two. User ID three of, for poll one, likes answer three also. Now, you might wonder, it's like, gee, isn't it confusing after you remember all those numbers? Well, this is on the database level. We're going to provide the users an easy, clean, logical user interface so they don't have to remember all this stuff, right? Because it would be a nightmare to have to remember like what the number of the answer you wanted to vote for was. You're instead going to want to create a nice little checkbox. So we're looking at it on the database level. All right. So let's go and let's write the query um, to give us all the votes here. All right, and we're going to build this query up. We're going to write this query um, simply, and then we're going to mold it into what we want. <laughs> Eventually, what do we want? Eventually, we want a list of the option and how many people voted for it. So eventually, we want our output to look like this. In this case.
So that's what we want in this case. All right. So if I were to do this, that's a step in the right direction because that's going to give us all our votes, right? Let's go and access and run this and let's see what that gives us. I'm going to create a query. And I'm going to go into SQL View. SQL View allows me to see the actual SQL behind the query. Sort of the visual query that you develop in Access is simply a user interface to write the SQL for you. Sort of helps you out. So I'm going to say select star from vote. And that shows me all the individual votes. All right. So this is moving in the right direction, right? Now, what's wrong with this? The way I see this, there's two things that are wrong with this. Yeah, all you know is the poll ID is one. You don't know the question. Um, all you know is the answer is three. You don't know the question. All right? And I'm really not interested in who voted for what. Right? I just want to show that. And additionally, I don't really care about every individual vote. I just want to see a total of the votes. So let's go in and let's see what those options are. In order to do that, we have to join two tables together, right? I want to see what poll ID 1 sequence number of 3 is. So I'll get that from the answer table. I'll look up that from the answer table. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to join the poll table and the answer table. So that shows me the answer text and all this other information. Now, if all we want to see is this, we can get rid of, we don't have to say select star. I can just say So I'm seeing kickstart, kickstart, monster, and kickstart. That's real close to what we want to have, right? Now, the only thing we need to do is we can display the amount. And this is where the count comes in. This is where we're going to use an aggregate function. 
aggregate function in SQL is where we return not answers for every individual row, but we return answers for groups of rows. And what kind of answers can we return for groups of rows? We can return count, we can return sum, we can return average, we can return minimum, we can return maximum, and there's probably a few others that I can't think of right now. But a count returns how many for a given value that there is. All right? So, I can say, select, star, select answer text count from vote answers where poll ID equals answers dot poll ID and vote sequence number equals answers dot sequence number. Is it clear what these things do? These things connect the answer to the vote. What is the connection between the answer and the vote? Well, where the poll ID and sequence number of the two tables match. That's what connects the answer and the vote. Now, if I try to run this, it's going to give me an error. All right? You don't believe me? Let's try it. Your query does not include specified expression answer text as part of an aggregate function. The way aggregate functions work are like this. When you have a list of columns, like we have here, answer text is a column, count is a column. When we have a list of things that we want to return, if we are using aggregate functions, Everything that we return must either be itself an aggregate function or included in a group by clause. Remember, we said that we are going to return, we said the whole purpose of aggregate functions is to return answers not for every individual row but for a group of rows. Well, we have to specify how those rows are grouped together. All right? We have to specify how those rows are, rows are grouped together. And in this case, we want them to be grouped together by answer text. So we want to show the answer text, and we want to group them together. We want to get a count by answer text. So if I simply add group by answer text here, then... It'll work the way that I want it to. And it shows that Kickstart has two, Monster has one. Now, right now, this shows me all the answers in the answer database, right? And all the polls. I'm sorry, it shows me all the all the votes in the answer database. If I want to limit this to show just one poll, because let's say I voted that I like Halloween, I don't want to see that in this listing. I just want to see for this particular poll. So that is also going to be on the where clause. So I will say where poll ID equals 1. So now if I run this,
Now if I run this, it will show me just the answers for that question. Sometimes it's good to work out your queries in the database first before you try transferring them over to ASP.NET. The reason for that is the whole idea of just fighting one, one battle at a time. All right. Um, make sure you have the query right first and then go and try to put it in ASP.NET. That way you're not trying to figure out the query and trying to figure out what you need to do in ASP.NET. All right. So, let's go and let's incorporate this into our website. All right. Let's go and incorporate this into our ASP.NET website. Let's run debug and let's show that first page, which if I remember right was default 2 in this case. this and right now this shows just the answers all right it would be nice to change this to show the actual votes as well so this is sort of the results page all right so let's go and change that this is poll and answers so I'm going to go and gonna look at polls and answers If I remember right, SQL Data Source 1 went with this, and that was the poll information. SQL Data Source 2 went with this, and it was the answer information. So, I could do this a couple of different ways. I could delete SQL Data Source 2 and Data and Grid View 2, or I could change them. I'm going to change them to illustrate a point. All right, I'm going to go in here and configure data source. I still want to connect to the same database. I still want to specify a custom SQL statement. I'm going to go and I'm going to paste this in here. Now, the one thing we're going to have to change is I don't want that to say 1 because I don't always want to show the answers for poll 1. I want to show the answers for whatever poll was selected. So I'm going to go and I'm going to change that to a question mark. Because remember, a question mark represents the value is going to be plugged in at runtime. All right. So I click Next. That question mark is coming from the query string, and it's coming from the field called ID. That part remains true. I can test my query, put in a value, and it shows me the right values for that. I hit Finish. Now, notice what happens. 
I have drastically changed the SQL data source. I've gotten rid of some fields and I've added some fields and so on. So therefore, it's asking me if I want to recreate that grid view. So if you have drastically changed it, you probably want to recreate the grid view because you want the grid view to reflect the new data that you're selecting. Sometimes if you make a change to the SQL data source and you're getting an error, um, you forgot to do this because the grid view is looking, is expecting the old data from your previous SQL data source. So click yes to regenerate it and it now reflects the new SQL query that we have in here. So now if we go and run this, This doesn't look promising. I guess so. to be my star page. And if I click on that, then I see the answers down there. All right. What is what is the point of this? The point of this is remember that 
SQL is versatile enough to give you pretty much the answer to whatever question you can think of. As long as it's a logical question from the database, you know, and not just something, you know, can you read people's minds and tell me what they're going to vote on this, you know. Um, that as long as, it, as long as the data is there, you can write SQL statements to organize and display the data any way that you want. And really that is really the power of relational databases. When you look at flat files, like files uh, where data is stored like they are in Excel spreadsheets, then oftentimes they're very good for displaying data one certain way, but they're not very versatile. In other words, it's difficult to, to display the data in any other way. But if you store data in a normalized SQL database, it's possible to combine that data, organize it, filter it in just about any way that you want to get the results that you need. Okay, so our next thing is going to, our next thing that we're going to talk about concerns logging on. All right, concerns logging on to the database. Now, it's always good to take inventory and to think about like what part of this do we know, what part of this do we do we not know. All right. And there's really two main things that we haven't covered as far as logging on. Because eventually what we're going to want to do is allow people to vote in these polls. And vote will, voting will require us to insert data into the vote table. All right. So. So far, all of our database queries that we've created have been tied to some visual control on our page. So we had a grid view. That was tied to a SQL data source. And those two were bound together. The grid view was bound to the SQL data source. And the nice thing is, is when you do things in that manner, when you have a visual control, and when you have a database object like this, and you bind them together, you don't have to write a lot of code. In fact, how much code did we write for any of these queries? How much C-sharp code did we write? We wrote none. All right? So that's one way that we can do database queries. And these are typically, you know, pretty basic queries where you are going to do some sort of query and display the results on the page. Let's think about logging in, though. Logging in is a little different than that. When I log in, I'm going to have a user ID and a password and a button that says log in or something. When I go and click the log in button, Am I retrieving data and displaying it on this page? No. I'm not going to go out to the database and display the user information on that page. I simply want to go out to the database and make sure that that's a legitimate person in the database. That there is a person for whom the user ID and password matches what was entered in. Actually, this is going to be email address. So in this case, 
case, I'm going to have a query that doesn't have a visual component to it. When they press this button, I'm going to call some code in the onClick event that's going to go through the process of querying the database and looking to see if they're a legitimate user or not. So I'm going to go and I'm going to take the value from those text boxes and I'm going to form a SQL statement and I'm going to query the database and I'm going to return a yes or no answer. I'm going to get a yes or no answer. Yes, they're valid. No, they're not valid. So if I've not entered in valid information, what am I going to do? Return an error message. So I'm going to display this is not a valid user. So, option one, if there's an error that's not a valid user, if, however, they do enter in valid user ID and password, what do we want to do? Right. We want to, we want to, we want to, we want to log, log them in, whatever that means. And in our case, log them in means we want to give them privileges that other people don't get. Namely, we want to give them the ability to vote. So, what I'm going to do, if they're successfully logged in, I'm going to take them to this page. Well, let's do this. I'm going to take another page that has a list of poll, list of all the polls. And when you click on it, I'm going to take them to a page that allows them to vote. So it will show the poll, and it will show an extra link that says vote. And I'm only going to display that if they're logged on. If they're not logged on, they get this much. Right? They can see the polls, they can click on it and see the results, but they can't click on the vote button. So they click on the vote button, they get taken to a page where they can vote on that particular poll. Now, after they've gone and voted, they might return to this page, and should they still be able to vote? Well, not for that poll, but for another poll? Yes, absolutely. So I want to keep them logged in. Think of Canvas for a second. You go in and log into Canvas, and maybe you're taking three or four classes, right? You can go into this class and look to see if there's any announcements or download the example or submit an assignment. You can then go back to your courses page and look up your accounting class and see if there's any announcements for that class. You can then go to your philosophy class and look up lecture notes for that and so on. You don't have to log on from page to page to page, right? Once you've logged on, you're logged on. All right. Can you try and really? Yes. Well, I don't know why, but they all of a sudden they changed that. Well, that sounds like an error to me. That sounds like a bug. All right. Ideally, you wouldn't have to do that. Once you're logged on, you're logged on. Now, should you stay logged on forever? 
When should you log out? Well, when the browser closes. All right. When else should you log out? After a certain amount of time. No of no activity. Right. Or when else should you log out? When you click log out. All right. So, what we have described is what's called a session, a browser session. A browser session should stay alive until you close the browser, you've explicitly said, I want to log out, or a certain amount of time without any activity happens. All right? Now, the interesting thing is, is that if you go to a website, the browser knows that, let's say, you've made a request at 1121. Let's say I go to Canvas and I log in right now at 1121. I may go and check to see if I have any email, and then I might go to ESPN to read about the Cleveland Indians. Does the, does the Canvas web server know that I have gone to ESPN? No. no. The Canvas web server only knows about requests I make to it. It doesn't know about requests I've made to other web servers. And therefore, that's why it needs to rely on a lack of activity. So, if a certain amount of time goes by without any request going to Canvas, they, the Canvas web server decides, well, that person went home for the day, that person went to another site, that person closed their browser window, that person stepped away from their desk, whatever. But it logs you off. Why does it log you off after a certain amount of time of no activity? Exactly. Oh, really? Right. Images all over his Canvas account. Right. Yeah, and that, that's unfortunate. That, that's horrible. So, number one is to protect the user. So, if the user walks away, no one can sit down and, and use your account. You know, like, could you imagine Gmail? You know, you could send an email from that person's account to, to anyone. That wouldn't be, wouldn't be very good. But there's also a win for the server, too. There's also a win for the web server. And what is the win for the web server? Why does the web server benefit from expiring a session if there's no activity? Because it, it holds that open and it's using the best resources. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's less it has to keep track of. All right? If a certain amount of time goes by and there's been no activity from an account, that web server's been keeping track of that session. Well, it's nice if the web server can say, well, after half hour, after 45 minutes, whatever, to expire that session. So it no longer needs to hold up the resources. Now, depending on how the code is written and all that, it can be a little resources or it can be a lot of resources. But there are some resources devoted to keeping track of every session. All right? Remember, I mentioned this last time, HTTP is a stateless protocol which means that there's nothing that ties one request to another that's built into the protocol. Therefore, the server has to devote resources to tying requests together. We found one example of how we can take something from one page and send it to another, and that was the simplest example, and that's via the query string. on the query string a little piece of information that we want to go from page one to page two. However, when you're talking about logging on, you're not talking about simply passing data between page one and page two. You want every page on your site to know who is logged on. So it doesn't have to ask you to log on again. And it only goes away if you've explicitly said, I want to log out, or if you've closed the browser, or if your session has expired. All right. That is done via what's called a session object. All right. So 
Next time, we're going to explore the session object and see how it's used to remember who is logged on. And we'll probably do something simple like on top of every page we'll put like the person's name to personalize it. That'll be one step. And we'll also remember the ID because later on when we get around to voting, we're going to need that person's ID to stuff in the database to say this person made this selection. So that'll be sort of what's coming, coming up ahead is the ability to um, log on to remember who's logged on and then use that information for displaying like a greeting to the person and more importantly using it when we cast a vote or do anything like that. So that's what we will pick up on in class next time. All right, questions? All right, see you over in lab.